Good morning. So glad to be bringing the word to you. Uh, this Sunday after a week off, I had extra time to be praying and getting excited about being back in Romans, preaching through Romans 14 this morning. I also just want to clarify, because Gavin said multiple times, our first missionaries to the continent of Africa ever. I want to be fair to the Gardner family who were in Africa and then moved out of the continent, but maybe in Gavin's lifetime, the first missionaries we've supported in Africa and in Mozambique. In Romans, we've been walking through this book for all of the summer, this letter to the Roman church by the Apostle Paul. And all throughout, we've used this term, strong and weak. This is Paul's term throughout the letter. He's writing to those who are strong. He's writing to those who are weak. That is not something physically, and it's not even something spiritually or emotionally. What he's meaning is simply those with a lot of influence in the community and those without a lot of influence. We began this series giving the background of Romans, and that is that there was an edict given by the emperor that all Jewish practicing people had to move out of Rome. Any ethnic Jews had to leave the city of Rome. And so that meant Roman Christians from the church in Rome had to be leave. They had to go back to Asia Minor. They had to leave the city of Rome. As Paul's writing this letter, there's a new emperor, and so the Jewish Christians were able to come back. In their absence, there are now way more Gentile or non-Jewish Christians than there are Jewish Christians in the community of Rome. And so now there's power dynamics. The Jewish Christians want to follow the law, and they want to practice the old practices. The Gentile Christians are like, we don't need to do that anymore. And it's creating this conflict over preferences of how to worship, when to worship. They're not divided over major issues of salvation and Jesus and the gospel. They're divided over preference issues over how we live this out, what does it look like in our daily habits and in our worship expression. So Paul writes beautiful theology we now know as the letter to the Romans in order to solve this problem of division in the Roman church. I say all of this because the heart of what he's doing is here in Romans 14. Those terms weaker and stronger appear in Romans 14 as he's talking about some of the issues they were divided over. So understand, as we talk today about a communal church division issue, Paul has used 13 chapters of theology in Christ as the backdrop for these are the important things. These are the things that bring us together. And now he's saying these are the small little things that have divided you. So let's see this big picture. Now let's talk about the things that you guys are upset about. That's how we get into Romans 14. But before we do, I want to talk about something equally as relevant and important in the Blue Man Group. How many of you have ever seen or heard of the Blue Man Group? Yeah, they were super popular, super relevant 20 years ago when they came as an off-Broadway show. If you've never seen it, it's three guys who wear bald caps and paint themselves blue and then make a lot of music off of weird instruments and they interact with the crowd. I saw them a long time ago when I was a child. I think that's the best time to see Blue Man Group. Then it was about five years ago that my wife and I were on vacation in Boston, where we've been many, many times, and other family members were with us, and they wanted to go see the Blue Man Group. And I was like, well, we don't have any children with us, and we're in our 30s. I've seen them before, and you can see Blue Man Group anywhere. We're in Boston. Can we do Boston stuff? Like, I would even just go see Paul Revere's house. As boring as that is, I, let's just go do that because that's a Boston thing. Blue Man Group, that's not, it's not, why, why are we doing, I remember saying to my wife, you know, when you're sharing a house with a family on vacation, I was whispering at night, like, I don't want to see the Blue Man Group. I want to do Boston stuff. And her being like, yeah, but it's their first time. Let, let, let's just concede to them. So we went and we saw the Blue Man Group. I will tell you, having seen it 20 years ago and having it seen it much more recently, recently, it's exactly the same as it was before. I assume different blue men, but the same exact show. In that, there's an important lesson that we walked out, and that is that whenever we do anything, if you've taken a family vacation, if you've had Thanksgiving dinner, if you're going out with anyone, there are concessions we make towards each other when it comes to preference. 
and it's a greater image of who we are as a community and the love we have for each other, say, when am I battling over preference issues? When should I be submitting and serving the people who are with me? And maybe I'm kind of just being selfish. Maybe I'm just being a baby. And maybe the relationships, the dynamics at play of love and grace are more important than my preferences of what I like. This is what Paul is saying in Romans 14. You have a greater love that's happening throughout this letter by Christ Jesus. There are divisions over preference. Here's how we deal with it. So as we talk about living in unity and love, maybe another way of saying it, making space for one another in the church. How do we make space for each other? The differences that we bring into this place, the things we like and don't like, the dynamics that we prefer when it comes to gathering as a church. I'm going to read Romans 14 through 15 a little differently than I have. We've been reading it in big chunks. This is such a large portion of Scripture that this morning I've chosen to just highlight some of the key verses, and we'll walk through those. I encourage you, after service or this week, go and read through Romans 14 through 15, 13 in its entirety, but this morning we'll be looking at some of the highlights. Romans 14, verse 1. Let's talk about embracing diversity with love. Paul writes, accept other believers who are weak in faith. This is the strong weak. And don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Now, Paul goes on in here to give an illustration of what he means when it comes to weak and strong. And actually, the illustration is one of dietary habits. Honestly, kind of oddly relevant in our culture today because he's talking about those who eat meat and those who don't, those who are vegetarians and those who are omnivores. Some of you say, well, no, I'm a carnivore. No, you're not. You would die of diseases because you're not eating vitamins. We eat everything. Some of us eat everything. Others have different dietary restrictions. This is the situation Paul's talking about. In Rome, the cause is different, though. What happened in the early church is that they decided on a few distinct practices to continue to differentiate Christians and non-Christians. And one of the practices was we don't eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. We don't eat that. We don't participate in those feasts. That's a differentiator for us. Now, the problem is, how do you know if the meat you're being served has been sacrificed to an idol or not? Is it stamped with a stamp of Zeus? Do they explain it to you? You don't really always know. In Rome, they had a lot of meat. They were very wealthy, and so they would slaughter a cow, slaughter a goat, and then they would serve it at dinner. And what they would do is, if they had meat and lived in a city, there were lots of temples. So you would kind of think, well, two birds, one stone. For dinner tonight, we're going to eat this goat. But also, we're going to honor Athena, so we're going to take the goat to the temple of Athena. We're going to offer it there, slaughter it there, cook it there. Then we bring it back home, and then we have dinner. So we're kind of, we're being religious, and we're being practical. Aren't we so clever? You get invited over to a neighbor's house. It's not always clear if the meat was offered to an idol or not. So some Christians, usually those that came from a Jewish background and were used to these sort of dietary restrictions in their life, would say, rather than take the gamble of eating meat sacrificed to an idol, I'm just not going to eat any meat at all. I'm going to play it safe, and I will just eat vegetables. I will just eat this beautiful hummus presentation here, but I'm not going to eat meat. And so they were trying to practice what the church was doing the Gentile Christians would say, hey, that's a little bit of an overreach. You're, you're overthinking this. Let's not get so... Don't, don't you remember the image of the blanket with all the animals on it that happened just 20 years ago? So we can eat everything. This dynamic is exploding in the church of Rome. There are Jewish Christians who are saying, no, 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 don't take the risk at all. Don't, don't eat it at all. That's one of the three things that the church agrees on. Don't take the risk at all. The Gentile Christians are saying, well, you're living really pharisaically, and you're overreaching in how you're doing this. God has given us grace, so let's just eat everything. And you can have an intellectual, honest, philosophical discussion around that. We have things like that today that we discuss and argue about in healthy ways. But the dynamic obviously has become too caustic, too toxic, to where rumor has it that Gentile Christians would now start trying to sneak meat into the meals of Jewish Christians in Rome to just prove a point. 
hey, you didn't even notice, and you didn't die tomorrow. God's not doing this. Then now the Jewish Christians are lecturing them. You don't even care about what God is doing. You're not even trying to live obediently to what Christ has called, and it's exploding, and each is taking the high ground. So Paul spends 13 chapters talking about what's truly important, the beauty of the God that we serve and the creation he's placed around us, the law of what it means to live obediently to him. And when we couldn't do that, that he himself stepped into our place, lived the law perfectly, died our sinner's death, conquered death itself in the grave, and then has given his sonship, his identity, his righteousness to each of us by his blood and in his resurrection. Paul's saying that's what's important. So now when we tackle this, keep that in context. That's what's made you a church. That's what's made you a community. That is our identity. Now let's talk about these lesser issues. Today, this is honestly a decent area of discussion in the church to even use, how we eat and our dietary restrictions. I believe wholeheartedly that living a life as a vegetarian or as a vegan is a fine and ethical interpretation of living out your faith in Jesus. I've read Genesis 1 enough to know that it is not God's intention to slaughter and to kill his creation. He has to do that to cover our sin. And for someone to read that and to own that and to live that out is a beautiful and true way of living out their faith. That is not how I live mine out. And I also believe that to eat is an expression of freedom in the grace of Jesus and to eat all things and to enjoy his creation is an equally valid ethical choice in how to live. I have, though, come into many situations and rooms where we don't talk to each other with the grace and respect on a small issue like that, to mock one another or to make fun of. We had missionary friends once who were making fun of a decision of that dietarily to Gavin, who is controlling whether they get support or not. And I'm like, bro, you got to stop. Why are, why are we treating each other like this? One issue in myriad issues that we allow to divide us rather than to love and respect each other on the issues that Scripture is not as clear on. This is how Paul says it in verse 4. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. The call is to refrain from judgment and to love and walk in grace with one another. Sure, we call each other out in loving relationship, but unless that loving relationship has been built, it is not a place to begin with judgment. The accountability is before God and his expectations. And when we take the judgment on ourselves so readily and so quickly, it speaks two things. It speaks, one, I believe that I have the authority in my righteousness, in my life, to do this, to treat you, to judge you in this way. It also says, I don't trust the Holy Spirit to be doing the work that he is called to do, to be drawing out that judgment, conviction into your own life. Paul says it continuing in verse 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember that we all stand before the judgment seat of God. Hopefully the intended build of Romans is similar to the intended build of Scripture. That as we read Scripture from beginning to end, we see a story of a righteous and beautiful and good God working through humanity who is incapable of living a righteous, beautiful, good life. And repeatedly we fail, and God repeatedly shows grace. Because Paul says, if you have that dynamic internalized, hopefully you do by these 13 chapters, or hopefully you do by reading the body of Scripture, you come to two conclusions. One, God is capable of ruling and judging his people and his creation. He can do it. He will do it. He is doing it. And number two, we don't hold enough righteousness to be the arbiters of what is good and true and judging the world. Those two things side to side. When we place judgment on newer, weaker Christians, do I believe I am worthy to condemn another? Some of us might believe that. I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. 
We are saved by grace, not our works. So we operate under the grace of Jesus and his judgment, not our own. And two, I believe that Jesus is capable of judging now and at the resurrection of all things. To be clear, this is not the same as lovingly challenging and learning from each other, which we should do continually. To learn from the mistakes of other churches, to learn to the mistakes of other leaders, to lovingly talk to others that we know in Christ Jesus and to say, hey, this isn't who I see Christ calling you to be. We should still be doing that. But what Paul's saying is, there is a tier system in how we understand the life that God has given us. And theologians for the last 2,000 years have kind of established three categories. There are three categories of how we know what's right and what's wrong. The first category is biblical gospel issues. These are the issues that make you a Christian or not a Christian, to follow Jesus or not. And Paul's saying for 13 chapters, this is what it means to follow Jesus. These are the non-negotiables of what it means to follow and love Jesus. Now, boiling it down to five is very tricky, and some of them have some nuance to them. But in short, a belief in the Trinity, that God is three in one, the character of who he is, that this is how he exists. Matthew 28, 19, that has already been referenced this morning, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, to know who God is. Number two, the deity of Jesus, that he is Lord and King, fully God and fully man. Number three, salvation by grace through faith, that we are sinners in need of salvation, that the world is fallen to sin and is broken and in need of redemption in Christ Jesus, and that that redemption comes through one path only, and that is faith in the grace offered to us by Jesus Christ. Third, the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus did conquer death and sin by raising himself, well, by being raised from the dead, and that one day we all will be resurrected. And then fifth, we know this because of Scripture. And however you want to interpret the terms of inerrancy, um, but authority of Scripture, that the story is true, and that it is revealing the truth of who Jesus is and who our God and creation is. These are the five... If you struggle with these. These are big struggles about whether you are a follower of Jesus or not. Then there's a second tier of them, the ethical, moral issues of what it means to follow Jesus, issues of ethic, ethics and morality, matters that relate to how we live our life. You can go to the next slide. These ones include sexual purity, honesty and integrity, compassion and justice, sanctity of life, love for enemies. These are beautiful beds for healthy Christian discernment and discussion. How do we live this out? What does it look like? What does it look like in my life, in your life? How do we engage with culture? How do we engage with politics? All of these are in here of how we interact with the world. And there are beautiful Christian brothers and sisters that I know love Jesus that I disagree with vehemently on some of their interpretations of these. But we walk it and we wrestle it out. And then there is a third category, the issues of opinion and preference. This is what chapter 14 is about. This is what Paul is saying, that there are dietary preference, days of worship, modes of baptism and modes of communion, how we do these sacred ceremonies, styles of worship and political affiliations, how we engage with these things. He says these are preferences. and These are areas that we walk very tenderly with and with much grace with one another we don't allow these to divide our church communities. If you've lived with a mind and a heart through the last three years, they very easily can divide the communities that Christ has brought together. And let chapter 14 of Romans be Paul's encouragement to you. Stop it. Show grace and mercy to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Place what's important as most important. We should be discussing with each other the depth of Scripture and who Jesus is a hundred times to the one where we discuss the next election coming up. We should be discussing a hundred times the beauty of the salvation we have received, the humbling nature that though we were far from God, he loves us and cares for us and died for us more than we ever talk about the mode of how we operate our schedule of service on a Sunday to place what's important above the other's. Paul goes on to say, let's pursue peace and edification. In Romans chapter 14, verse 13, he says, So let's stop condemning each other. 
Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Asking ourselves the question, am I a stumbling block to someone else receiving and knowing the love of Jesus? Am I getting in the way? Most of the impediment to people knowing Jesus is not Jesus. It's mostly us. It's the body of the church and our individual working out of our sin by his grace. It's the time a new person was here and we said, hey, I'd love to grab coffee with you. And then we ghosted them and never followed up. And that person says, five years later, I went to this church and they didn't care about me and no one followed up with me. It's that person who comes into the church and they're working out their life and their faith and they see an older member of the church, look at them condemningly because of how they're dressed or how they're coming into the church. They're not dressed well enough. They're dressed too revealing. And they see, and I'm telling you, they notice the eye looks passing by them. And they remember that. It's a word of lacking grace shared to someone. It's a lack of care exhibited to someone. And we should regularly ask ourselves, am I a stumbling block to someone coming and receiving the grace of Jesus? My job is not to save someone. My job is to not get in the way of the Holy Spirit saving someone. Amen? Paul says, to boil it down, let's show each other a little bit of grace. They may be wrong. They may have spoken out. Let's show each other grace in how we discuss and love each other. Specifically, Paul says, if you are a follower of Jesus of any length of time and maturity, even more so, you should be humbling yourself before the new people coming into the church body. You should be making the effort, loving them, caring for them, drawing them in and bringing them along. He continues, Looking ahead, in Romans 15, too, he said, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. This is how we do it. Help them do what's right, build them up in the Lord. We go back to our three-tier system. We do that by starting at the top, by sharing with them our love of Scripture, sharing with them what Jesus has done in our lives, sharing the testimony of what it has meant to follow Jesus. Sure, I've made mistakes. I've fallen on my face, but he had grace to get me back up again and sharing those stories with new people coming along. That is why it is so important as a church or as a follower of Jesus to repeatedly ask ourselves the question, am I coming back to the center of what we do and why we do it? And by coming back to the major points of what it means to follow Jesus. And we can simplify it down to very simple three. Am I teaching other people to read Scripture the way I read Scripture? Are they seeing it through my lens of the hunger and passion I have for Jesus? Am I sharing them the story of what Jesus is doing? Am I taking time in prayer and teaching them that prayer is more about listening than talking and I am someone who in a very loud, very busy world can take time out to sit in silence and solitude and listen to a voice of God who moves at a different pace than we do? And do I show them how to serve others graciously, lovingly, and generously in my community and in my relationships? Simple as that. Back to those three, over and over again. Are they seeing my love for God's story in Scripture? Are they seeing me spend time with Him, literally and relationally? And are they seeing it produce love and grace in my life? There are so many more things to following Jesus and living a Christian life. But as Paul would say, let's get the major parts right before we start arguing over the minors. He gives us a beautiful encouragement in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 15. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He comes back. You're squabbling over minor issues. Come back to unify yourself in the foundation that Christ has made. It is by Christ. It is for Christ. It is in Christ and through Christ that you are a community. Come back to the center point of who he is. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul gives an example of this to the church in Philippi. There are two church leaders in a squabble. The squabble is over preference. Paul says to them, 
You should put on the character of Christ Jesus in this particular argument you are having. You are arguing over something that is not gospel-centered and essential. You are arguing over preference. And so what I'm going to encourage you each to do is to lay down your life for the other one. And in this moment, that means lay down the preference of what you want for what the other one wants. And if that's hard for you to do, let me point you back to the point of all of this faith we do is that God himself let go of his preference of living in heaven, stepped down onto earth and lived a life submitting himself to his created beings, submitting himself all the way to allowing his creation to kill him on a sinner's cross and bury him in the grave. Paul says, if that's not enough then sure, argue over your preference of how the service goes. Argue over the potluck and who gets to decide which meals are being served. Argue over the songs in the set of who's not singing the right songs and where the volume is or how we should dress and serve. You continue those arguments if you don't think that is the same call for us today. What if you both came together and fought for the other's preference? What if you both tried to compete in serving each other and you didn't worry about getting your way but that your worry was I want to make sure they get their way so badly that I'm going to lay down mine for them and I'm going to serve them and I'm going to give to them and if I am trusting that God is good and working in both of us, their heart is going to be doing the same and we are competing for each other's benefit and each other's good life and each other's loving will. Side note, if you are looking for marriage counseling, that is a great place to start as well. That is where you start. That is where you return back to. That is where you find your strength to continue forward. Compete in serving each other and laying down your life for the other. What actions does that look like in the church today? How do we do that? I think two good places to start. The first is avoiding judgment and criticism being slow to judge and slow to criticize in a community and culture where criticism and judgment are highly prioritized and valued, we can be countercultural. There are lots of churches who operate in ways that are not my preference and operate in ways that I wouldn't go to that church and that's not how I would do it. I have a dark, sarcastic streak of criticism in me And I have to fight that when I'm talking to others about a different church, a different pastor, a different mode of worship and service to not be critical. But I think Paul calls us, if they are loving Jesus Christ, we should be focusing on that and celebrating and building up the global church and our local church. He literally says in another letter, even if someone is preaching the gospel of Jesus for ill gain, I'm going to celebrate that they're preaching the gospel of Jesus. Can we say that in a world where we take little bites of other sermons and little bites of other services and pass them around to criticize what those churches are doing? There's literally a TikTok account called Christian Nope, where it's someone who just walked, it's a video clip, they walk in, they sit down in a service, then they show a 10-second clip out of context of a church that they don't like, and then it's a 10-second clip of them getting up and walking out the door and saying, nope. That's shared, I've seen that so many times by the communities I'm a part of, shared in videos and in stories. I think, I don't know, you take any 10 seconds of my sermon here of any week you want to, and I probably would look at it and be like, nope, I don't want to go to that church, and that was me that said that, and I don't think I want to go there. Years ago, when I was first a lead pastor, um, I made a bunch of changes. The benefit is that I'm fourth generation of this church, so when I would make changes, I could say, it's not because I don't care, it's because I think that we need to move forward in order to reach the community. But it was tough, and it was hard, and I made mistakes, and it was difficult in our communication of it. And I will tell you, um, if you've ever sat in a service and you said, I don't really love this song, or I don't know about this worship, I will tell you, you are common, and every person who has ever stepped in any church for all eternity and until Christ returns, worship sets are the most difficult thing to organize on a Sunday service. And I give Rachel and the team and every other worship pastor so much credit and grace in how they do, because every set, some of us in the room are mad about it. Every set, some of us love or don't like, or I don't like this song, that one, the volume, the lights, it is constant. It is constant. I'm just going to give you an encouragement. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. That's true about all of us. That's what Paul's talking about. 
I was a young pastor and had made changes, and I got a note. Um, I would, people would use, if you don't know, behind the scenes, people will sometimes use prayer cards filled out as criticism cards just so that I get to know. That's common. Every church does that. That's okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. And there was one that was particularly clever, and it said, if Jesus is the light of the world, why are we worshiping in his dark cave? And I said, you know what? <laughs> I'm not even mad about that. I'm going to give you credit. That's pretty good. Um, and it was anonymous, but because of the handwriting, I knew who it was. <laughs> and um, I said, I said, oh, man, I have two choices here. I can either have a loving, confrontational conversation about this, or I can ignore it and pretend it's not here. My personality is to ignore it and pretend it's not here, but I knew that was not what Christ was calling, and I was like, I'm going to have to have like a two-hour conversation around this, and I was stressed about it and praying about it, and I spent the whole night before that Sunday like praying about this, you know, God, work in this, like, give me the words, maybe we have wisdom, and it was amazing. Service is ending, and we had our altar prayer time. And that person walked up to me, and they said, Pastor, I did something wrong. I don't know if you know this. I wrote a critical letter. <laughs> and I was like, you did? Um, and they said, they said, and I felt like in service the Holy Spirit said to me, there's one Jesus to be worshipped. There are many ways to worship him, and I need to submit my preference and focus on the goodness of God in Christ Jesus, regardless if I like the room or the lights or the sound. And I said, amen, thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, you, and I literally said in the meeting, I was like, the Holy Spirit saved me two hours this week um, and just spoke directly. And I used to say to the older generation, I go, when I'm in my 80s, I know I'm going to say, like, I don't think the pastor should be a hologram. I don't like it. I, I don't think every song should be done by guitar. And I think when they wear the silver bands around their face, like, it's just going to be. That's just how it is. But can we lovingly submit our preference of a method of worship so that others can receive Jesus Christ? I think our team does a great job of melding and listening and walking this forward. And I think all of us at this church do a great job of showing grace to one another that we can worship multi-ethnically, multi-generationally um, together in giving Christ Jesus glory and honor. And this is what Paul says finally, where we get to the product of this. Romans 15, verses 7 and 9. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. This is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. He says, if we can just lay these things down, we can gather together and with one voice, with one heart, as one family, do what we are called to do, and that's give praise and glory and honor to our Savior, Christ Jesus. We can come together, and what we do in the beginning of services when we sing these songs is our mutual confirmation, commitment, and affirmation to each other that this is how the world works, this is how our God is, and this is who we are by that understanding. When we sing this song, I say this is how the world works. It is good, meant for good, but it is fallen and broken. And the God who made it all has stepped into our place to redeem it, to save it, to fulfill it, that we may live forever in a redeemed heaven and earth. And by that, I live a life of redemption and forgiveness and grace to those around me because of Christ Jesus. Our unity comes not through our preference, and some of us in the room may be younger and we like our songs this way, and maybe that's how we do it as a church, but that is not how our unity is formed. Our unity is formed by understanding the God we serve who is made known in Christ Jesus and the goodness he has shown us on the cross and in the resurrection. As Paul continues in verse 13, I pray that God... The source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's tough to lay down our life for each other. 
almost impossible to do, but for the grace of the Spirit of God living in us, allowing us to do what we couldn't do on our own flesh, allowing us to live in unity when I want to be selfish, allowing me to forgive when I am deeply hurt or wounded, allowing me to be generous when I am scared about my own resources and life, that the Holy Spirit lives in the Church of Christ and calls us to live as more than we are and to live by the grace of Jesus. He says we do it because we are filled with the inner joy and peace of knowing we are loved completely by the God who has made us. I don't argue about preference when I am so filled with complete knowledge of who I am. I am saved and loved. I am redeemed and empowered. I have eternity promised in my heart and my life because of the gracious work of Jesus. And so I want you to have what you have. I want you to get what you want. And I hope that in this community you are doing the same for me, but I trust that even if you're not, I will still do it because Christ did that for me before I ever knew him or served him. And the peace that in the end all will be well because Jesus Christ rules and reigns. I may not control every aspect of this, but I know that Jesus ultimately will. And I can lay it all down knowing that he is in control. Justice will be served. Love and mercy will be given. And the creator of this universe will receive glory through his son. Since this is Paul getting practical, I just want to close with three practicals. I think they just make us a better church. Just drive us forward. First, we practice this in our Sunday gatherings. A lot has been made said that, you know, we can do house churches and I can do church anywhere and, and Christ. But this is all of us. This is our large gathering. This is all of us that say we are Pennington AG Church. All of us that are united behind the vision of leading people in Mercer County and the greater area of New Jersey into relationship with Jesus. That's us. That's who we are. And that when we gather on a Sunday, I think Paul would say, give all of yourself into this gathering. Bring it. Sing loud, whether you have a good voice or not. I don't, but I sing loud. Lift hands, even if you're tired. Submit and, and give glory to Jesus. Take notes when someone's preaching and show your dedication, your focus, your hunger for God's word and what he's doing in our church community. Serve when you can. Participate and greet and help our kids and lead if you can sing and serve in the booth and make this happen and give all of ourselves on a Sunday. Be fully present here. Second is we are launching back into small groups in the fall, following our Back to Church Sunday on the 17th. Get into a small group community and center a relationship around Scripture. We study Scripture. We walk through it together communally, gather around others, centered around what Paul would say is most important, is the story of who our God is and who we are by His reflection gather with others and focus on what is most important. I will tell you that if we get these first two right, all of the divisions of who we are seem so much smaller and inconsequential. And third and final is take care of your own heart and soul outside of our gatherings. Read your scriptures. Spend time in silence and solitude. Discipline your life. We are only as strong as each of us coming into this gathering and take care of your soul. Let us pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to give an opportunity. If you're in the room this morning and you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus or maybe it's been a long time and you want to say like, hey, this morning... Pastor Brian, I want to commit into that relationship with Jesus. I want to know him. 
I want to receive all that story you were sharing of a God who loves me, puts himself in place for me, sees me as righteous and good. I want that. I want to know that. I want to this morning give you an opportunity to pray one simple prayer that is a step forward into that relationship. If you are a follower of Jesus, for all of us, make this a recommitment this morning of the majors of why we are a community. Pray this with me. Jesus, I thank you that you came and you put on flesh. You created all of this by your very voice and your very character. You put all of this into motion. And when we showed ourselves incapable of ruling it and following your will, rather than destroy us, you came and you lived among us. Fully God and fully man, you taught us, showed us, and lived an example of what it means to live as a true human. Then you went beyond that, and in your righteousness, you took on our sin our brokenness and you died on a cross in our place. You took on the full punishment of the fallen nature of this world and our sin and you were buried in the ground. And on the third day, you conquered sin and death by resurrecting and promising each of us one day, even if we may die on this earth, we will be resurrected and live forever in a renewed heaven and earth, present with you and with one another. Jesus, you gave your life for us. Today, we commit to live our lives for you, obedient and according to your will and your way. We pray this in the name of Jesus.